Good morning. Thank you for coming. I know I had, I had tough competition, I have to say. Claudia Fernandez is hard competition, so I'm really glad that you, you made it, that you made the choice to stay with me. Um, first of all, I would like to thank the committee for this opportunity. Um, I, was, um, I was at a welcome dinner for the plenary speakers, and, uh, and uh, I told them that I was very proud to say that I'm the first ever Chilean plenary speaker. Um, it took 14 years. It was a bit overdue, I think, but at last we are here. I think it is important that um, if we are going to have an IATFO Chile conference, we should have representation um, from Chile as a plenary. So I'm glad that this is just the beginning for many more opportunities for many of you, okay? So first of all, to thank that. Um, uh, when I was first invited to participate at the conference, um, I had a very clear idea of what I wanted to talk to you about because these are the major, my, my main motivations uh, throughout my professional career. Uh, so I wanted to talk to you about that. But then I realized maybe the idea that I have about what I want to talk about do not really go with the title of the conference. And then I went and checked again the title of the conference and the title of the conference is um, ELT in Chile, where we are now and where are we going, or something like that, right? And I thought it fitted perfectly with what I want to say, because what I want to say is basically try to go into what the, the place where we are at the moment and how we can move on from that place. So it fitted perfectly. Besides, uh, I, was, I was playing with the title of my presentation here and I was thinking, it's great because on top of everything, the bag is Rojo Furioso as well. So it kind of, it kind of matches, so um, it, everything fits perfectly. Now, uh, again, thank you for the opportunity. I'm the first uh, Chilean, as I said. I hope I do a good job, otherwise there's no more people coming later. So I just hope everything works uh, now. Um, just uh, to start, I would like to know who you are. Um, I don't need your root number or anything. It's not what I mean. It's, I would like to concentrate mainly on what you actually do. What is your profession? Have you noticed that we have that at, the, at our ID card? How many of you have teacher there? OK, good, good, good. That, that indicates something. That is identity, at least in my book. And how many of you, could you raise your hand, how many of you work at school, either primary or secondary? OK, OK. How many of you are uh, in the training process? You are still teachers to be. Okay. How many of you work at university? Oh, a lot of people work at university. Okay. Uh, at other institutions such as uh, publishing houses or any other advisory institutions? Okay. And policy? Okay. Okay. So we have a, a good mixed crowd. I think it, that's very good. So um, this is the focus of my presentation. We are going to be talking about um, TEFL in Chile. And I would like to start from the macro, from a more macro perspective, a macro view into the more, uh, uh, sorry, the macro view to a micro uh, level of exploration. And um, I would like to start by just first concentrating in Chile. Um, and I said, what am I going to talk about Chile? We are, I mean, we're Chileans, we are here. What is there to talk about? So I started uh, asking a couple of friends that sometimes come for travel, not the friends that stay here in Chile. And I asked them what they think about when they think about Chile. What do you think they said when they think about Chile? Wine. Wine. <laughs> it's the first thing they said, wine. Seafood? Seafood? Probably the, I was hoping for them to tell me the miners. They didn't. Um, and they say the landscape, the Andes. Every time they come by and they're flying to get to Chile, sometimes from Argentina to Chile, they, 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 you see the Andes is so, be so beautiful. So every time they think about that, they just give me very good examples of nice things about Chile. And then when they told me the Andes, my first impression said, if we ever get to see it, because we never see it, it's always so polluted. So then I immediately started thinking, I'm, I'm being so negative. Why am I concentrating on what's bad? 
And then I realized maybe that's just part of our idiosyncrasy. Um, there is a word that we use in Spanish that maybe the foreigners will not know. We use the word chaqueteros to say that we're always looking down on ourselves and we always find anything that we do badly. So when I ask Chileans what they think about Chile, these are some of the things they said. <laughs> Earthquakes. We even make jokes about it. When there is an earthquake that is 6.5, we go like, 6.5, but that's ridiculous, it's nothing, that's a little shake. There's nothing wrong with that. But because we are used to that. But that is just one example. We are filled with national disasters. Filled with national disasters. Um, and then, <laughs> um, fiascos. We are filled with those. Probably that happens in every country. But who would have thought that a bridge that is ready, that is ready, they just realized that the, the branches of the bridge were changed. Where they were like upside down, left to right. Um, but we kind of think, we, we saw that in the news and we said, here we go again. <laughs> you know, this is Chile. And then something that is a bit more serious, but that always we talk about that, especially lately in the news. For the past probably two or three years, it has become a lot of, uh, part of a lot of discussion. It's uh, inequity. We have this huge gap between the rich and the poor, and we have this very small percentage of the population, probably 1%, that probably hold of the wealth in the country. So this is, this is how we see ourselves. So if you, if you look about that, you're going to see that we, again, concentrate on the bat. The grass is always greener on the other side. And uh, when we think about education, we tend to do that as well. So if we think about education and we want to find solutions for what we are doing wrongly, what is the first place we always look at? Finland, <laughs> because we are so alike. <laughs> we are like twin countries. Um, there is so much that we have in common, so we always look at them, of course, because we, you, we, we can transfer things easily from Finland here. But no, we are very different. In terms of numbers, we are already different. Look at the size of the population. Look at the amount of uh, the gross national income per capita. It's, it's a, it, these are two different countries. Look how far and distant we are. And not only in numbers, but in terms of the whole educational tradition is very different. The curriculum is a lot more flexible, for one thing. And I was reading about Finland the other day, and uh, they have one of the highest rankings in inter interpersonal trust. Trust. We are suffering from trust a lot in the country right now. So I don't know where, where we have, what do we have in common? In terms of English language teaching, is ESL, it's not even EFL. I was reading a report when they were saying that 46% of the amount of English that people listen to is in the streets. You won't get to listen 46% of English in Chile. So I don't think there is a lot to copy or to transfer. And here's where I agree with Hayes, who is giving us indications of how maybe trying to copy and transfer examples of education from one country to another and from one place to another, it doesn't always work. And we don't even need to go that far as to think about Chile and Finland. Even if we think about Santiago and Limache, Santiago and Chiloé, Many times we just try to plan strategies that go for the whole country and then people in Chile tell us, but you know, that's not going to work here. Situation here is different. We need to take about a boat and take two hours to go from one place to another. So even in the country, we cannot just transfer things that work in one place and we think we would work someplace else. So I think it is important that we take this into consideration. So if we cannot really uh, look beyond or look that much far because things do not work when we try to transfer them, what can we do? And we go back 
we go back to Teflon Chile. And for this, I would like to do a little exercise with you. Don't worry, I'm not, ask, I'm not asking you for yoga or anything. Just a tiny little exercise. I would like for you to stand up. It's not going to take you long, just stand up. Okay, ready? And I would like you to locate, this is not an obscene call or anything, I would like you to locate your navel, your navel. <coughs> Did you locate it? Okay, now, without, without stretching too much, I would like you to, I, I know your dress, do not undress. <laughs> I would like you, you just uh, in the same position where you are, just try to imagine your navel here and try to bend over a bit and look at it for about five seconds. I'm going to count. Look at it for five seconds. Let's go. One, two, look at it closely. Three, four, five. Okay, ready? Okay, thank you. Please sit down. Okay, so let's try to go over the exercise again. Um, we don't do that often, do we? It's weird. We feel silly. And if you look at your navel for a long time, if you're there, you feel like it's a bit uncomfortable? It hurts your back a bit? And then when you are looking, probably you found things. For example, I found that my belt is a bit old. Maybe I need to change it soon. And you could find a stain in your blouse. Or you found out that the color is not really what you wanted it to be like because it's being washed out from so many washings. So you start to notice things. Oops, sorry. That is the invitation that I would like you to, for you to do now, is to do some navel gazing, okay? So basically, I know it's uncomfortable. I know it may hurt a little. I know we never do it, but the idea is that we try to look at something deeply, closely, for more than just a brief second and try to see what is there that we didn't see before, okay? That's the invitation. So, navel gazing has a negative connotation. Sometimes it's, it's considered to be egotistical, but I would like to take you on a good side and think about this in terms of introspection, okay? In terms of meditation, in terms of looking at what we are doing. So, that is what I'm going to invite you to do. So again, taking the title from the, from the conference, where are we now? Let's see where are we now. Let's look at the facts. English language teaching in Chile. I was looking at um, some information from the Institute of Statistics. And um, on the question of how many people speak English, this is declarative information. Out of 10 people, one of them, um, said I was able to hold and maintain a conversation in English. Only one out of 10. Now, most of that group of people are mainly in the age of 15 and 29, or those are the people that declare to feel more comfortable speaking English. Those are the fluent ones. What else do we know? If we look at the national curriculum for English in schools, for English in schools, because it's where most of the um, teaching of English happens, this is what they indicate. They indicate that the national uh, curriculum suggests that um, English becomes obligatory from fifth grade onwards. So we, we, we finish one period in eighth grade and then we finish another period in fourth grade. So in total we have eight years for learning English, okay? And they also suggest, the Ministry of Education suggests, that these are the standards for us uh, that we should reach. So basically our goal is B1, okay? Now, what does B1 stand for? What does B1 stand for? All of this. 
So basically, you need to understand main points of a conversation, you need to produce sim simple text, you need to describe experiences, give arguments, simple conversations. So pretty much the basic to be able to function in an EFL setting, okay? If you want to speak English. Now, more information about the B1 situation. You know that we have, in Chile, we have this SIMSE evaluation. The SIMSE evaluation tells us where we are in terms of nationally, in terms of certain areas. In English, the hope is that we reach B1, right? Where are we? Out of 10 students, this is a, since SIMSE 2012, out of 10 students, Five students are below A1, three students are A1, one student is A2, and only one student is B1 out of 10. One student in Chile is B1 out of 10. So one student out of 10 is reaching the goal. Now, the bad news is that probably all of these students come from private schools. They do not come from the public sector, okay? So when we look at that reality and we see how incredibly painful that is, you, we start talking about why this is happening. You know, it appears in the news and uh, Chileans cannot speak English, uh, school is failing, we are not uh, teaching English properly. So a lot of people start thinking about factors and making hypotheses. These are some of the things that they say and this is what I what I collected from looking at Facebook uh, comments, you know, and the newspapers when you, when you see the uh, things online. And these are some of the things people say. Now, what I wonder is from all of these things that we say, how much information do we actually have of any of those factors? So, my first initial reaction is when people make those comments is this one. So the problem is that we are starting teaching English too late. You have evidence to prove that? What is it that we know about what we are doing, either right or wrong, that could help us move forward? Let's see. If, ev if evidence is going to give us facts about whether something is right or wrong, then we actually need some more of that. Then, if we have these factors, I'm going to start looking at each one of them. So first I'm going to look at the issue of limited exposure. I calculate the amount of hours that we are supposed to have in the eight years that we are supposed to be learning English at school. And out of the eight years, this is the amount of hours that we have at our disposal. 741 hours, okay? That is supposed to help us reach B1, supposedly. Now, I was checking an ALTI report, a report from the Association of Language Testing, and what they recommend in terms of hours to reach B1, and this is what they indicate. that we need 350 hours of guided instruction in order to reach B1. So when I looked at the number, oops, we have double the amount of hours. So again, okay, what's going on? We have double the amount of hours. There's something that we are missing here, some kind of Language hours are leaking somewhere, where and how they are leaking. So I started to look for information from different sources, and I found uh, that information that um, we collected at the English Open Doors program. Uh, the English Open Doors program, through the support of English language fellows, um, with the support of the U.S. Embassy, they were uh, they are a group of very committed group of teachers that. Um, traveled the country and observed 100 lessons. And from those 100 lessons that they observed, they just was one little piece of information that for them it was particularly relevant. And that is the fact that in Chile, we have a lot of these happening in our classrooms. Out of 10 classrooms, seven were interrupted 
And it's not an interruption of two minutes, it's a longer interruption. So if you think about that in terms of what it does for our language learning, it, it takes out a lot of hours. Now, um, what we can do about that, I really don't know, because it seems to be part of our school culture. We constantly get interrupted when we are teaching. And we are interrupted in moments when we shouldn't be interrupted, like when we are starting or when we're in the middle of giving an explanation. So evidently that affects things. Now, if we want to go further into exposure, and we want to look more into where, in which other moments, some English language exposure is leaking, then maybe we can look at some other piece of information. In the SIMSA test again, we, um, the Ministry of Education provided a survey to a students that were taking this exam. And the students were asked uh, how much or how many how, no, how likely it was for their teachers to speak English the whole time in the lesson. So they say, does your teacher speak English the whole lesson, for example, and they tick the box. And the percentage was that 50% of teachers spoke English the whole lesson, 50%. Now, the problem of that figure is that it tells us that this is the amount of teachers that speak English the whole time, but it doesn't tell us the amount of English spoken in the lesson. So it still gives us a very partial view. So again, the English Open Doors program, again in an attempt to collect additional information from a survey to teachers, um, they asked them how much of a class that you do is dedicated to speaking English. And um, this is, oh, by the way, this is a survey uh, done to teachers in municipal schools. Why municipal schools? Because we know that those are the schools that have been neglected the most. Right? The teachers said that 53% of the time of their lesson was devoted to English, meaning speaking English. The rest of the time is just Spanish. Now, we have to consider that one, these are municipal schools, this is not the whole system. And another important thing is that this is declarative. This is what they say they do. Now, I talked to the English language fellows because they went to observe some teachers. And they say that this is about right. It's about 50% of the time that they speak English. Now, we would have to measure whether that is actually the case. But that is, in general, the situation. So if we go back to our big number, we have that number. And I made a calculation of the number of hours that we are, that are leaking from interruptions and from Spanish use in class. So. This is what we are left with, OK? But then again, we should be making it. So oops, again, we don't know where um, we are failing. We don't know where more hours are leaking, or we don't know what is really going on. But then again, there are, there are things we need to consider. Not everything in learning in general, in English language learning, can be reduced to numbers. And that's the problem. Sometimes too many things are reduced to percentages and numbers, and there are so many other factors to consider. So there are caveats about all these calculations. And then I looked at the ALTI um, report again, and the ALTI report says that there are all these factors that need to be taken into consideration um, to be able to um, make some kind of match between the, your amount of hours and the common European framework. Um, and I would say it is about right, because for example, when I looked at the issue of background and I look at SIMSE results, I realized that the students with the higher results were the students whose parents um, were more highly educated. So if your parents went to university, for example, it's more likely that you're going to get higher scores. So that was, that was also perceived. Besides, the amount of exposure shouldn't also be limited inside the classroom. We have limited exposure outside. We are practically a monolingual country. So I think that also affects matters. So the good thing is that that documentation is there and that we need to be uh, taking it into consideration. So again, if we look at the factors, we have talked a little bit about the limited exposure situation. But we realize that the information that we have is just partial about that situation, right? 
Then if we want to look at something else, let's look at motivation. People always say, students are not motivated. They, are, they don't want to learn English. So let's look at motivation. What do, what do documents say about motivation in adults? Well, what we think we know, which is um, they mainly study because they want to improve their job opportunities. Okay? And, and so because, um, and so some of them want to study abroad is that they want to study additionally in language institutes. In terms of the students, they don't really want to study English. They don't care, they don't see the, the need, but they are aware that English is important, okay? At least they are aware that it is important. But now there is a very interesting study um, done in Chile about motivation that um, concluded the following. Learners' motivation increase if teachers actively address it, promote learner autonomy, and are able to select context-appropriate materials. So even though motivation might be an issue in our classrooms, there might be a way of improving it, of increasing it, if we do something about it. Okay? This is a, recent, a very recent report. So again, we have some ideas about what's happening in terms of motivation, but it's, it's still there is a lot of things that we don't know. So again, we go back here, and we need to look at the issue of large classes. Large classes is probably the area where we have the least information of. Uh, the only study that address uh, large classes was a, st uh, was a a long study, um, PhD uh, thesis by Maria Jesus Inostrosa, and she concluded that it didn't appear to be a major challenge, large classes. It didn't appear to be, but it was perceived as problematic by teachers. And I would say that this coincides with some um, international research. Uh, Fosha Shamim has a, she, she talks about threshold levels, meaning it's the perception of the teacher that seems to feel that the classroom is too big. So you have 40 students in one classroom, and then if next year you have 20, and then one year after that you get used to that, and then probably you think that classroom is too big. So it's, a, it's mainly a matter of perception. And of course, it's context sensitive. So here, we lack information, and we lack a lot. What else could we talk about? Grammar. It's too much grammar. We teach too much grammar. We have a problem. Let's see. Again, English language fellows supporting us. They went and observed teachers. And they, just to conclude, they just found out that most lessons in Chile are grammar-based. So based on Scott's presentation yesterday, we are probably back in the, in the 60s, 70s. We are far back. And we use a lot of uh, terminology in classes. The issue is here that um, focusing on grammar is not bad. So I think we, are go we have gone to the extreme of telling people do to not teach grammar. And teaching grammar explicitly and using meta-language has been considered to be effective. The problem is how much is too much and also how and when. It's the same thing with L1 use. Spanish is allowed in the classroom. It shouldn't be forbidden. But then there is this question again of how much is too much? When do we make a distinction? Okay? But then again, a lot to study in terms of grammar. The jury is not out, I would say, in terms of grammar. Um, probably not the last issue, but almost last. Starting late. We start English, uh, teaching English too late. We should start when they are three. Uh, people say that, um, but you know what? We are starting early. 5,000 schools requested books from the ministry to teach English to young learners. And if we look at subsidized schools, probably most of them teach English in primary, and private schools, probably all of them. So we are not really starting late. And then it seems to be that learners enjoy the experience. They are motivated. They seem to be having fun. The problem is 
that studies internationally indicate that that motivation decreases as they get older. So they are very motivated and into English and they are not so happy about English anymore when they are about 15, okay? So we need to take that into consideration. Besides, most of the studies carried out about young learner um, studying English at a young age are all done overseas. Most of them have done in immersion contexts. And some studies indicate that children learn English fast and easy because in average they have about 17,000 hours of exposure when they are young. We don't have that amount of exposure in an EFL context. So even though the population thinks that is actually better to start young, we need to really consider all the facts because we are not an ESL context, we are not an immersion context. If we think nationally, we are still a context of English as a foreign language. So just to be careful about taking into consideration research that has been carried out everywhere else in contexts that are very different to ours. And this is what happens. We are taking examples and we are learning lessons from contexts that are so different from ours. It doesn't fit. And this is one of my favorite quotes ever about this kind of thing. Perhaps too much research is published to the world and too little to the village. It resonates with me in so many levels. Um, there is so much uh, talk about what happens elsewhere but there is so little to inform teachers' practice, and especially in this part of the world. Now, there is one issue that we haven't addressed, and this issue, forgive me, I'm very passionate about, is this thing. This probably has been my major reason for activism in the past years. I was looking at information about this, well, it's part of my research study as well. And I just realized how much media could actually inform the view that people have about teachers. Um, the teaching profession in Chile, at least, probably all over the world, but in Chile it is particularly problematic. It's in a very low status. And I was looking, I was doing screenshots of different headlines in newspapers and the media and sorry, but they are in Spanish because I just took them as exactly as they were, not to try to change them. And this is what I found. Now, it seems to me that blaming teachers sells because m probably many of the things that some of these people said was not really against teachers, but they managed to turn things around to make sure that it, they look bad. They make teachers blame for everything. Um, this is the media. So I was wondering whether teachers share the same view which evidently I completely disagree with. And this is what um, I came about. I was not talking about the view of teachers. I was talking about something completely different. And this came out. I don't know in other countries, see? The grass is always greener on the other side. We are bad. Probably they aren't. These are teachers talking about other teachers. This is a teacher educator talking about another teacher. And they talk about they. They. When I was listening to them, of course, I didn't say anything. But when I was listening to them, I was thinking, why don't you include yourself? <clears throat> because it's they, it's not me. And this is teachers blaming teachers. 
Teachers will probably forgot what it's like to be a teacher in Chile. Teachers have probably forgot what it's like to teach 45 hours a week and probably having three or more hundred students, three or four tests to correct, 12 or more lesson plans to correct. This is something that makes me very passionate and very angry. It makes me angry because the only way that we are going to change things and we are going to be able to study what we do is from giving teachers the trust that they deserve. And this has been widely discussed. Look at what Prieto says here. Society does not perceive teachers as social reflective agents. Neither they are giving the institutional freedom to identify problems which affect them and take decisions accordingly. They are expected to develop agendas, apply practices, and transmit knowledge developed by others. So we are supposed to do as we are told, and we are not supposed to think, we're not supposed to have feelings, we're not supposed to reflect, and on top of everything, our colleagues blame us for what we do. I think we need to stop. We need to stop the, the naming, we need to stop the blaming, we need to stop bullying. I don't know if it happens a lot in other countries, but in Chile, I think it's enough. I think it's our all responsibility to try to do th something about it because it's widely spread. We do it all the time. So let's be careful about what we say and what we do because everything goes into society, into teachers are bad. So if we go back to that, again, there is no evidence that teachers are bad. But if we look at this whole list of things, you realize that we don't know much at all. We don't know much at all. We practically know anything. So, if we try to think about what we need to know, we might know about what happens in Chile overall, but do we know what is happening in Chile in our classroom? How can we in our classroom inform what, what happens elsewhere? Probably we need to concentrate in our own classes. What am I doing as a teacher in my own setting? Are my students motivated? What am I doing to motivate them? Is the use of my language, is my English affecting them? How much am I supporting their English? How much, how much exposure am I promoting? Am I giving them opportunities to listen to English? We need to find out what are we doing in our own classrooms. And I think a good way of doing this is by teaching, researching, collecting evidence, and probably learning from them and acting on them. After all, research based on my own definition and not of the definition of a big, thick book is basically the systematic search for answers to the questions we ask. So we have questions, we collect evidence, and then we move on. And simply that is research. Why? We need to do some more navel gazing again. Navel gazing is not at all bad. We need to start from our own classes, our own students, our own students. What is it that they do? What is it that I do? And then move on into my colleagues, my peers, other local teachers, university professors, and maybe local research. Let's stop looking for answers outside. We need to start from our own context. What is it that I'm doing? What is it that is failing in my class? If I notice that it's failing in my class is the motivation to my students, then I'm going to go and ask peers and talk to people and see what I could find elsewhere. It's really nice that you are all here and you're listening to me. But my first recommendation is for you to find out what is happening in your classroom. Don't get an advice from me. First, look at what you are doing, how, how you can probably make it better. That, for me, is a starting point always. And that is what the Champion Teachers Project was trying to promote. The Champion Teachers Project is a project developed by the Ministry of Education and the British Council. And it's a project where we mentored a group of teachers to carry out um, action research in their own classroom. This is an example of one teacher, a teacher just like any of some of the teachers that are here. In his own time, he developed a project. 
um, his project started with um, a doubt, a puzzle about group work. He was 100% sure that what he needed to do in his classroom was group work. So he was obsessed. I need to do group work. I know group work is good. I've been told that group work is what works in my classroom. My students are always in individual uh, seats like this. It doesn't really help. So we try to help him unpack the problem. Think about what is it that you want to know. And he came up with the following questions. How do my students behave when they're sitting individually? How does the seating arrangements affect individual work? How do students feel about individual work? What is it that is happening before you kind of plunge into using group work? Find out what's happening. And from that, well, he did uh, questionnaires. He asked a peer to observe him. He recorded his lessons. And after he did all that, he realized that this is what his students said. I feel more comfortable working in pairs. I can work with who I want, and we can divide the tasks. Not everybody works when we are in group work. Now, we didn't tell him. He found out um, from his own exploration that this is what he needed to do for his students. And this is what we think we need to do. So right now, we are going to do a very short little exercise. And we are going to think about success. Maybe we shouldn't concentrate on problems so much. We can concentrate on success. So we think about success. Usually when I ask teachers to think about a moment of a success, successful class, they tell me things like this. Oh, my students were motivated. How do you know that your students were motivated? How do you know you had a successful class? Because I got that feeling that something was right. But let's try to go more deeply into this. Let's move from signs to evidence. So I'm going to give you a few seconds to think. Think about a recent successful experience. Go over it in your mind. And tell me what you, or think about what you saw, you heard, and you felt. I've done this exercise with a number of teachers. And mostly what they say is this. Students were smiling. Students were speaking in English. I felt satisfied. The students were talking to each other. The only problem with that is that it gives you a very superficial view of what actually happened. So I usually, this is my own metaphor, I usually talk about peeling the onion. What you see your students are smiling, when you see your students participating, that is the outer layer. If we start removing layers, we are going to realize that maybe there is a lot more at the core so what is it that your students are doing? You say that they are motivated. What is it? How do you know what they're doing, what they're saying? What are you doing? What are you saying? In which moments that you say they are motivated, this is happening? Ideally, you should try to build from that success. If you realize that your students are motivated in certain moments of the lesson, or when you do certain things, these are the kind of activities that you should try to continue to do. But you need to peel the onion. You cannot stay at what you see at the surface. And that is going to take you to evidence. These are some of the different ways that you can collect evidence. These are examples of evidence that you could collect. For example, asking for your students' feelings, opinions, and interest. The class could be successful from your standpoint. Is it successful for your students? You can do activities about I like, I don't like, fill gap. And it could be a simple exercise in English that could turn into a whole set of question answer activity. It could turn into a survey. You can take notes from your classroom. You can ask a pair to observe you. You can do all sorts of things to collect data, to collect evidence. It's not time consuming if you try to mix it into your teaching. If you do that, then before you realize you are doing research again. And then research wouldn't be so far away from your everyday practice. It would be part of your practice, actually. So this is what I've concluded from four years of working in the Champion Teachers Project. An evidence-based approach to teaching can raise teachers' feelings and confidence and self-esteem. 
These are the examples of two teachers. For me, that is empowerment. That is agency. That is giving the teachers the opportunity to inform their own practice. The question is, who is mediocre now? You think these teachers were mediocre? Do you think you who are here on a Saturday morning are mediocre? I don't think so. Where are we going? We talked about where we are now. I don't know where we are going, but I have hopes of where I want to go. And I would like to go to a more evidence-based approach to teaching English that is ours, that is Chilean, that we could use to inform practice. I would like to see teachers collecting evidence about their own teaching, and I would like to see, for once, university-based teachers collecting evidence that is relevant for classrooms, that is relevant, that can be used, that is comprehensible, is not in jargon, is not academic-ish, that teachers could understand. Um, and I would like to see university-based teachers researching with teachers, not to teachers, not researching them as lab rats, but researching together, learning together, possibly to collect evidence that could inform practices. Because right now, we are not really using our own evidence. We are using evidence collected elsewhere, but not here. We have great things. We have great flavors. We have fabulous food, excellent wine. We have amazing landscapes. We have a beautiful country where we have amazing people. And we are, and we are champions of the Copa America. <laughs> I mean, 20 years ago, I would have said that. People would have laughed in my face. So we are champions. And we have champion teachers. So I don't think we need to go that much further. We need to concentrate on what we are doing, believe in ourselves, believe in our professionals. It cannot happen that the plenary speaker is starting, it's in front of here with you today, 14 years after. You need to value what you do and what your colleagues do. That is my message today. Thank you. Thank you.